What is the message to the rest of the world? We have been here for thousands of years. We tell you, things are changing. Our planet is changing. Vanishing waters in the west, rising waters on the coast. Could all this, the sunny paradise of Miami Beach, one day be overcome by the ocean? Is it already beginning to happen? There is virtually no debate among climate scientists now. Most agree that climate change is here and that we are the biggest reason. We may also have to be the solution. You'll see powerful new evidence from people who say climate change is already changing lives, right where we all live. You'll also learn what we can do to protect our planet. You start thinking about the families that have now lost their loved ones. Our children. He said, I'm alive, but everything's gone. Ourselves. We don't have time to argue. It's happening before our very eyes. It was the moment that changed my life. Our year of extremes. Did climate change just hit home? In the U.S., there's still more rough weather to report tonight. You know, this is the driest they have seen since 119 years. The state says at least 30 highway bridges are completely destroyed. From here down across the Cape, winds are gusting 35 to 40 miles an hour. It feels like an all-out assault. For the last year and a half, it seems Mother Nature has thrown everything at us. Look at the cold air that is surging into the upper Midwest. A bone-chilling deep freeze, searing heat, drought, and fire, floods gushing through the U.S., Europe, and Asia, and superstorms devastating entire regions. What on earth is going on? For more than a year, we travel to far corners of our planet, searching for answers to what's causing these weather extremes. This is the storm of a century. We this met ordinary people who've this seen changes this. up close and asked some of the world's brightest scientists, is the weird weather a coincidence or a sign of fundamental change is here? The planet is not just changing, it's changed. Accompanying us some of the way was NASA climate scientist Tom Wagner, who's been studying polar regions, glaciers and sea level rise for more than a decade. We first met him in 2007 in Antarctica, reporting on melting glaciers. He's one of the vast majority of climate scientists who agree that the Earth is warming and changing our climate in fundamental ways. The basic physics nobody disagrees with, which is that as the planet warms up, you have warmer ocean temperatures and you have warmer air. That's going to cause more extreme weather events by itself, and we're already seeing that. Just this past week, an influential group of the world's climate scientists named the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued a groundbreaking report saying climate change is already sweeping all the continents and oceans of our planet. Their position, there is no doubt the planet is getting warmer. Wait a minute. If climate scientists are so sure the Earth is warming, you may wonder, why was it so cold in parts of the U.S. this past winter? Here in Chatham, Massachusetts, on the sixth day of spring, blizzard conditions, wind gusts of 60 miles per hour. We're in a snowstorm, another one. Winter began typically enough, but soon gave way to a Siberian chill. On January 7th, some 50 cities from the Rockies to the Atlantic Ocean registered record lows. Power lines snapped, water pipes froze solid, and home heating bills soared by up to 50 percent. But what really stood out was how much snow there was and how far south the cold crept, as far as central Florida. Cities that are normally balmy were put into a deep freeze. Atlanta was paralyzed by ice as a storm hit the city. Tens of thousands of people were stranded like this mother of two. I've lived in Atlanta for the past 18 years. I don't think ever we've had anything like what happened this year. Jennifer Wilkins spent 24 hours caught in a nightmarish traffic jam, unable to reach her 10-year-old. For five hours, she didn't know her daughter was safe until she got a call. And when I got that call from the middle school, I just started crying. The severity of the storm caught her family and Atlanta unprepared. It just seems to be getting more, you know, more extremes. Extreme hot, extreme cold, 
All this freezing cold might be enough to make you think that climate change, sometimes called global warming, can't be happening. But it might surprise you to hear about one theory scientists are still researching that actually suggests warming could be a cause of extreme cold. Why is it so cold if the Earth is warming? It's cold here right now. It's actually warm everywhere else. And if you look at the averages and you sum up the total Earth, it's still warmer. And you know what? It's warm in the Arctic, though, because that cold air is here. The cold air he's talking about is a freezing blast from the Arctic. Most years, that icy air, the purple area in this graphic, is locked near the North Pole, trapped by a boundary of swirling winds called the polar vortex. But this year, an unusually warm one in the Arctic, something happened. The polar vortex broke open and the cold air came south. So what causes the polar vortex to break? Sometimes you get warm air high up in the atmosphere that causes this polar vortex to break down. Wagner says one theory is that when the Arctic warms, the icy boundary of the polar vortex weakens, allowing cold air to spill south. But that theory is still being researched and debated. Do you see a link between the amount of cold weather we've seen in the Northeast and climate change? I see it as an example of what we can expect more of. We're looking at extreme weather events and we're saying, is this a sign of climate change? What is the answer to that question? The answer is yes. Extreme weather is a sign of climate change, and it's the kind of thing that we expect more of as the Earth continues to warm. Here's where it gets confusing to people, though, right? You can't attribute any one single event to climate change. In other words, there isn't enough evidence to point to a specific weather event like Atlanta and say for sure that climate change was the cause. But it fits a pattern of extreme events that has scientists like Wagner concerned. And the important thing about this is where are we going? What kind of changes do we have to plan for? So why is the planet getting warmer? Over the years, you've probably heard debate about whether man or nature is to blame. But now, for most climate scientists, that debate is over. 97% of them agree, as humans burn fossil fuels like coal, oil, and gas, pumping carbon dioxide, or CO2, into the atmosphere, the planet warms. You're saying it's impossible for it not to have something to do with the, with the warming of the planet, just because of simple physics. Literally impossible. There is no argument that mankind's activities have caused the planet to warm. In fact, the past year was the fourth warmest on record, and the consequences of that warming can be deadly. We just lost a whole hotshot crew. You're looking at a place where parched earth, withered crops, and the sale of livestock tell a story of fading hope and fear. It might look like the surface of another planet, but this is California in its third year of drought. This reservoir, two hours north of Los Angeles, supplies fresh water to some 200,000 people. But the area is in a drought emergency because the water level where I am down here is supposed to be more than 50 feet higher up there. That is supposed to be the boat dock. And it's only April. The hotter, drier months are still ahead. Parts of 23 states in the U.S. are already enduring drought. In the West, the number of areas with the most extreme drought has nearly doubled in the past year. This used to be a plush, nice town, and now it's starting to look like a ghost town. In Lake of the Woods, California, we found Tara Shirk trying to catch any passing drop of rain. So you collected this rainwater from yesterday? I collected this from yesterday. I'll use the water to flush my toilets for watering my plants. You pray for rain? I pray for rain all the time. The town's creek has dried up. The wells are almost without water, too, and recent drilling hasn't produced a trickle. The low-tech water meter here signals what the residents are told. Their town has only a few weeks of water left. Tara uses any clean shower water to wash her dishes. I notice you have a dishwasher. And I do not use that <laughs> at all. My dishwasher is used for storage. The drought here has proved too much for some of Tara's neighbors. This one's empty, this one's empty, and then I have two down on that end empty. All because of the drought? All because of people just fearful and leaving. Now Tara is looking for a miracle. I feel in my heart that it's just going to keep getting worse. I want something to happen. I mean, I don't know what. The drought that threatens her community also threatens the heart of one of California's biggest industries. 
California's farmers, who supply nearly half of the nation's fruits, nuts, and vegetables, have been forced to cut back production. Food prices are expected to rise. The drought we're seeing in the Southwest is probably one of the worst droughts in like the last hundred years. Why specifically the Southwest? Just the way that the air moves around the earth, you're gonna wind up with a drier Southwest. And although normal cycles of weather can cause drought in this region, NASA scientist Tom Wagner says persistently warm Pacific Ocean weather systems have kept rain away from this area. And the heat is affecting the snowpack. Snow falls in the winter and then it melts throughout the summer. But what's happening is that snow is going away earlier. Melting faster, he says, as temperatures rise. We have a shorter period over which there is snow on the ground. And if extremely dry conditions aren't a big enough threat, the ongoing drought, that some scientists call a mega drought, is increasing the risk of wildfires. In California alone, some 800 wildfires, big and small, have already ignited in 2014. That's three times the normal number. The U.S. Forest Service says nearly 70,000 communities across the country are in wildfire danger zones. That's more than 40 million homes. Winds will be west 6 to 12 gusts to Jim 20, Houston leads California's Laguna Hotshots, an elite group of firefighters on the front lines of some of the biggest and most ferocious fires in the country. How have fires changed since you started fighting them? From when I started in 89 to now, it seems like the fire seasons have gone much longer. When I first started, it was within a six-month period, basically June to, to November. But that has changed dramatically, he says. We joke about it being a year-round fire season. Houston says the longer fire seasons aren't just putting communities at risk, they're also posing dangers to the men and women on the front lines. Can you take much more in terms of the demands this job is now requiring? The one thing that's going to get us is if we're so fatigued, our head has to be in the game. No matter how sharp Houston's crew might be, wildfires can be unpredictable and sometimes explosive. Last summer, his team worked alongside Arizona's granite mountain hotshots weeks before the unthinkable happened. I got the phone call an hour after it happened, and I didn't sleep for two nights. You heard on the phone what exactly? We just lost a whole hotshot crew. Still. And I said, the grand amount of hotshots were burned over and killed. 19 hotshots from the same crew died. The deadliest day for wildfire fighters in 80 years. It was a tragedy that rippled through the nation. You start thinking about the families that have now lost their loved ones and what they're going to have to go through now. Yep, from but Houston yeah. can't afford to dwell on the tragedy fire season is already here once again. And scientists say this drought is expected to persist. So you're saying that there is not a lot of debate among climate scientists about that? There's always a debate about specific events, right? And it's hard to attribute any one thing. But we can say some general things that we expect to happen as the planet warms. And one of those things is that the southwest will get drier. And that places like the east will experience more intense rainfalls. We have what seems to be, at least for now, a very abnormal situation. Well, not abnormal in that this is the new normal. And that new normal has sparked a new theory about wildfires, a theory that led us to the top of the world. And I've never seen something like that here. Life here has changed too. We have been here for thousands of years. Why should we pay that price? for your way of life. Here we go, crunch. One, two, three, boom. Yeah. Our boat smacked up against drifting chunks of ice that could be thousands of years old. This dazzling ice scape seems a world away from the parched farmland we've seen in California or the wildfires we've watched blazing in the Southwest. But it is here in the Arctic that climate scientists say we might find not only some of the most dramatic climate change going on right now on our planet, but also a source of the extreme weather we've been tracking elsewhere. The Arctic is a very useful bellwether of change and, and it's, it's ringing.
American glaciologist Jason Box has been studying Arctic ice for 20 years, and he says the ice is melting on a scale and at a speed scientists have never imagined possible. Look at that! Greenland each year recently is, is losing about 300 uh, billion tons. We caught up with Box in Greenland, home to the massive Jakobshavn Glacier. It's been discharging ice into the sea as icebergs for hundreds of thousands of years. But just in the last six years, as captured in this time-lapse video, it has doubled in speed. I've seen this world's fastest glacier lose an ice shelf the size of Manhattan Island while doubling in speed. This is a monumental change. And ice hasn't been melting at such a furious pace just in the Arctic. Scientists have observed record ice melt all over the globe, from Alaska to Peru, from the Himalayas to the Swiss Alps. It has uh, changed the whole way of life. Aqualuklinge is a leader of the Inuit, the indigenous people of the Arctic regions. He said for them, climate change is not a theory, but a fact of life. The only humans around the North Pole in the Arctic are us. We have been here for thousands of years and we tell you things are changing. For thousands of years, a time even before memory, the Inuit have been able to read the sea ice. It's been the highway to their traditional hunting grounds. But just in the past 20 years, the ice has been melting earlier and earlier in the year. It has become unpredictable and unstable, even dangerous. Two years ago here, a young couple uh, died uh, falling through the, uh, the ice. We saw firsthand how the Inuit are trying to navigate this new world when we accompanied them on a hunt. They were looking for animals like walruses and seals, traditional food for their families. But within a few hours, they found this instead, thin ice. Mads Ol Christiansen told us he had to watch his step, saying, The ice is melting so fast in the old days, it was this thick up to my stomach. Whips cracking, the hunters pushed the dogs on until they came to an expanse of open water. Not so long ago, the hunters told us, this water would have been frozen solid this time of year, a road for their dog sleds. Now they had to use their dogs to haul motorboats into the water instead. For the next few days, they hunted from these boats with no animals in sight until suddenly a glimpse of a seal, a shot fired, and they hauled their kill onto their boat. It was only enough to feed their dogs. Can you explain why they're having such a hard time finding animals? Yeah, we've seen in satellite measurements the, the sea ice edge has just been moving northward. And it's on that edge where the, the seal like to sit and, and just kind of rest. So that's where the hunters want to go. The problem is it's moving further north, uh, out of reach. Got it, okay. So why is the ice melting so fast? To get a look at the reason, we boarded a boat with Jason Box and headed out to Iceberg Alley, the channel where icebergs flow from Greenland's interior down to the sea. Ice is nature's thermometer and when it melts away, you know that there's some extra heat that went into that ice. He said the ocean's temperature is increasing here as it absorbs heat from the atmosphere around it. And that warmer ocean water is what's driving the ice to melt. It's not that the air is warming, but yeah. the water is warming. Yeah, the big story is in the ocean, and it's way down deep, far from where we are, but it's heat exchange. Hmm. That's the trigger mechanism for the acceleration of these glaciers. But if the increasing temperature of the ocean currents is speeding up the melting of the glaciers, Jason Box has a new surprising theory about something else that may be actually speeding up the warming even more. Oh, here we go, look at that. The usually pristine ice looked dirty gray in places. The ice is white except for there's this, these huge swaths of darkness. What does that mean? Yeah. I mean, most likely it's dust, but also in that is some, some wildfire soot. It was hard to imagine, but Box was saying that soot from wildfires in North America had traveled all the way here, coating the ice with carbon particles, transforming it into what he calls dark snow. And what happens with dark ice, dark snow? Light-absorbing impurities um, trap more sunlight, 
and that can hasten the melting process. And if there, if there are more forest fires, then it's going to be more soot. Yeah. Which mean, and you're saying the soot on the ice causes faster melt. So what are we talking about here? It's a good example of human activity and climate change um, combining in complex ways that, that further promote melting. And that human activity, our use of fossil fuels, is for the most part taking place far from the Arctic. And that makes Inuit leader Akwilak Linge angry. Why should we pay that price for your way of life? Why? And there is something more, he asks, that we think about. We are experiencing the climate change every day, and you are about to see it tomorrow. In fact, most climate scientists say the tomorrow Akuluk is talking about might have already begun. How did my house get here? <laughs> It came in a flash, and it was a catastrophe. The creek kept rising. It started taking out houses. Colorado's September flooding was one of the most extreme weather events of the last year. More than a whole year of rain fell in less than a week. The flooding damaged or destroyed some 20,000 homes. Entire towns were inaccessible for days. In just the last month in Monrovia, California, sudden downpours again caused chaos. Wow, look at this. Yeah, this gives you a sense of the amount of mud and debris flow. It all comes from the canyon 24, 24 acres beyond up there. In Washington state, it was so much worse. Flash flooding and mudslides brought tragedy. Some 30 people have died. And around the globe, it was a year of massive floods. It's really high right now. A state of emergency in Canada, huge swaths of Asia underwater, and in parts of Europe, the wettest winter in some 250 years. It all had us wondering if floods are connected to climate change. As the planet warms up, you have warmer ocean temperatures and you have warmer air. The warmer air can hold more water vapor. When you combine those things, you wind up with much stronger storms. In other words, says climate scientist Tom Wagner, when it rains, it really pours. That means even long periods of drought can be punctuated by intense and dangerous rainfall. We've seen increasing frequency of heavy, heavy downpours all across the country. Scientist Jennifer Francis with the Institute of Marine and Coastal Sciences at Rutgers University in New Jersey has been studying the planet's atmosphere for more than 25 years. What you can see is these big... She has um, a bold eddies. and controversial theory that directly links intense storms to what's happening in the Arctic. The key, she says, is what's known as the jet stream. Why California can't get any rain or snow, it's that Arctic jet stream. The jet stream is literally like a river of air, and it takes a wavy path as it travels around the northern hemisphere. Those waves in the jet stream are what create the weather that we feel down on the surface. Beyond basic meteorology, Francis is arguing that Arctic ice melt is changing the jet stream. What we found in our research was as the Arctic is warming faster, it's causing these waves in the jet stream to get larger. More like this right. and less like this. Less like that, exactly. And when that happens, those waves tend to shift more slowly from west to east. The slower moving waves, she says, hold weather systems in place for longer periods. So a severe storm will take longer. Nice weather will take longer. Right. In 2012, Frances published a paper about her new theory warning that more extreme weather was on its way. Then, just a few weeks later, Hurricane Sandy began to form. Good evening. Tonight, much of the East Coast is on high alert. At their home in New York's Staten Island, Pedro and Jen Correa watched the news nervously as Sandy churned toward their home. I knew something was different about this storm. I could see it. Pedro evacuated Jen and their two children, but he stayed to try to protect their dream house. When Sandy hit, 
The storm surge combined with high tides and the water quickly rose all around him. You and were was, in the house. I was in the house. But I was starting to think I'm going to die. Pedro clung to life on a rooftop for hours before Jen got word that he had survived. He said, I'm alive, but everything's gone. It, it was this, it was the moment that changed my life. We got to go through this, remember Bobby? A few days later, reunited, they went looking for their home in a small boat. Where's my house? It was nowhere to be seen. That's my backyard. It had been carried a half a mile away into a marsh. How did my house get here? Yeah, it was almost to too much for Jen to comprehend. <laughs> hang on, hang on. Hang on. They salvaged little bits of their family history, their daughter's baby book, it's ruined. a waterlogged wedding photo. I love you. I love you. you make it Twitter, okay? Even though Sandy wasn't the strongest hurricane to ever hit the East Coast, it was blocked in place by the jet stream, causing unprecedented damage. For Frances, it was sad evidence her theory might be right. You know, all that coming together was like watching a bad dream unfold in reality. A dream you saw coming. The possibility. We saw the possibility. That theory about a direct link between Arctic ice melt and more intense storms seemed to be bearing out. Sandy happened the same year as the greatest ever recorded Arctic ice melt. We still can't say for sure whether these two things are directly tied to each other, but um, it just seems an amazing coincidence if they're not. Do you believe they are? I do believe they are. Her theory is on the cutting edge of climate research. Some scientists say it has merit but needs more study. Roger Pilkey Jr., a climate change public policy expert who has testified before Congress, is among those who say human activity has led to climate change, but that Francis goes too far. There are some who have linked catastrophic events that we're living through today to climate change. What is your problem with this? Well, the fundamental problem is that the science just isn't there to support those linkages at this time. It is unfortunate some advocates for action are, are willing to jump on the latest extreme event um, and use it to say, this is an example of climate change. Pilkey, whose views are a lightning rod to many climate scientists, says at least 50 years of data are needed to show change. And those who make a direct link between recent extreme weather and climate change are risking their credibility. I'm all for recognizing outlier perspectives and interesting hypotheses that are out there, um, but they do have to cross the bar of convincing their scientific peers, which in that particular area has yet to be done. You are stepping out and saying, I believe that these are related to climate change. Mm -hmm. I think the risk for myself is worth it. People are starting to realize that climate change is not a gradual warming that is going to be a concern for their grandchildren, but not today. This is happening now. It's happening before our very eyes. That was my front porch. Whatever was causing the extreme weather, back on Staten Island, Pedro and Jen were still picking up the pieces, trying to rebuild their lives. After the devastation of Sandy, they, like millions of others living on the coastline, were asking themselves, is it safe to live near the water? All of these condos, high-rises, hotels, and they're right on the water. They're very vulnerable. It was a beautiful house. 11 months after Superstorm Sandy sent waves rushing through their Staten Island neighborhood, knocking their house into marshland, leaving ruin behind, Pedro and Jen Correa had a decision to make. It's my whole life right here. Rebuild or move to higher ground. There's nothing here. This is the end of a neighborhood. We walked with them through their old neighborhood to see what was left. These people that lived here, these were like family to us, you know. Pedro showed us how high his new house would have to be to withstand a storm surge the size of Sandy. You're saying the house would have to be 16 feet 16 off the feet ground? Ahead. That would be as high as the light post. Just the thought of living next to the ocean he had loved so much scared him now. That ocean was going to become the, the boogeyman to my children, to my wife. They went to sleep, they would go to sleep every night wondering if the ocean would come in and take, uh, take our family away. They had never given much thought to climate change before, 
never really believed in it, but now Pedro and Jen blamed it for uprooting their lives. I'm not a climate expert. I live next to the water. I've seen the changes, and I'm not trying to convince anyone. You know, that's not my job, it's not what I want to do, but it's changed my mind. Climate scientist Tom Wagner says one reason for Sandy's devastating storm surge, the ocean around New York City has risen about a foot in the last 100 years. And he says rising seas are going to impact many millions of people living in coastal areas in years to come. Duke scientists all agree that the sea levels are rise. I want to get you to answer that directly. Do they all agree upon that point? There is no disagreement about sea levels rising. That is measured. It's not a model. It's not a theory. It's none of those things. And what those measurements show us, Wagner says, is that sea level is expected to rise at least a foot more in the next 100 years, and possibly three or four feet, maybe even more. Is it your sense that people will have time to get out of the way? That's, yeah. It depends on who you are, where you are, and what your resources are. If you're in an extremely low-lying area like Bangladesh, people talk about a foot and a half of sea level rise displacing 10 million people. If you're in the United States and you have resources, it could be that what will happen is areas right on the coast could get damaged, but that they will be able to move to interiors. A recent study by the World Bank lists cities around the world with the most to lose economically from rising sea levels. Five American cities make the top 10, Miami, New York, New Orleans, Tampa, and Boston. Consulting sea level rise maps and topographical data Artist Nikolai Lamb tried to visualize what an America under siege from the ocean might look like. Here's what he imagines would happen to the Jefferson Memorial if the sea rose by 12 feet. Here's the Statue of Liberty at 25 feet. Lamb is not a scientist, and his projections may be overly dramatic because most scientists think a 25-foot sea level rise wouldn't happen for centuries, if ever. But these images, especially of South Florida, do make you think. Here's Lamb's illustration of Ocean Drive in Miami Beach, Florida, at 5 feet of sea level rise, at 12 feet. At 25 feet, he imagines the thriving beach mecca might be underwater. When you look at Miami Beach from all the way up here, it becomes pretty obvious why it might be at risk. The low-lying peninsula is surrounded by water, hemmed in by the Atlantic Ocean and Biscayne Bay. And there's another reason that you can't see that makes Miami Beach, a city of 90,000 people, even more vulnerable. Because it turns out, Miami Beach was built on a porous limestone plateau, which means seawater can force its way into the heart of the city through drains and up through the ground. And it's already happening. During high tides, ocean water can overwhelm the drains here, flooding roads like this one facing the bay. I was here in October, last October, when we had those high tides, and I actually went in the street. I had the water up to my knees. Karen Bolter is a research scientist at Florida Atlantic University Center for Environmental Studies. Her work focuses on mapping which parts of southeast Florida are most at risk from rising sea levels. According to one of her maps, that road she had been standing on would most likely be underwater by the end of the century if nothing is done. We don't have time to argue. It's, it's here, it's happening. And we need to do something and there's an urgency about it. And Bolter told us her sense of urgency comes not just from thinking about the worst case scenario in which Miami Beach is underwater. She says just a few extra inches of seawater could have a serious impact on people's health. We have a lot more risk of contamination to our water supply and disease vectors. When everything is wet, we have more mosquitoes, those are some of the issues we need to be looking at. And there are billions of dollars in property at stake, too. Bolter took us to the seawall on Miami Beach so we could have a look for ourselves. I can tell you with certainty the water will be higher. It's not going to stop rising. And how much higher, that's what we don't know. But we're getting more and more accurate. And we need to eventually make drastic changes so that the water doesn't come up over the seawall. But Miami Beach is spending a lot of money to make sure that doesn't happen. 
That road where we first met Karen Bolter is just one site that is currently under construction, part of a $400 million plan to keep the water out. They're planning to install 60 pumps in the next five years. She acknowledges that the pumps have a short lifespan, that this short-term fix won't defend the city against how high the sea is expected to be by the turn of the century. And that's okay for now because we have time, 2100. <laughs> We won't be alive then, but our children will, and that's what's important. By now, we had heard and seen so much about the potentially devastating impact of climate change, we wondered if anything could be done to stop it in its tracks. So the question is, can we slow down the train? What would it take? What can we do? It's kind of like, you know, putting a man on the moon, like, or, or going into World War II. It's kind of all hands on deck. We'd seen the devastating impacts of extreme weather, drought and fire, storms and floods. It's kind of wanting to pull. We'd heard from scientists who told us climate change is already here. Human beings are basically re-sculpting the planet. This is happening now. It's happening before our very eyes. And that was also the message of last week's big climate change report. It said if we don't act, none of us will be immune from the ravages of climate change, that hundreds of millions of people could be displaced by rising seas, and that competition over food, water, and places to live could lead to conflict. The report also gave examples of how we might cope with climate change, like building new sea walls or growing crops that can survive warmer climates, and addressing the threat to our ocean food supply. Even so, we wondered, is there anything we can do to stop climate change altogether? Can we slow down the train? It's tough. In the next hundred years, it's really tough to deal with the changes that are coming. We probably can't affect a lot of those. On the longer time scales, though, we can have dramatic effects. According to scientist Tom Wagner and most climate scientists, the way to most dramatically slow down the impact of climate change is to find a way to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions one way or another. We can have a tremendous impact, and that's something that we need to work on. And that work has already begun. While still high, U.S. carbon dioxide emissions are lower now than they were in 2005. And power companies are beginning to experiment with cleaner energy sources. Like this hybrid solar natural gas power plant in Florida, one of the first of its kind, the Florida Power and Light Company estimates the plant could reduce its carbon dioxide emissions by millions of tons in the next 30 years. The earlier and the more significantly we take action, the less the possible risks are going forward. Climate change public policy expert Roger Pilkey Jr. says tackling climate change is bigger than any individual company or person. So changing my light bulb is not going to make that big a difference. Changing your light bulb is not going to make a big difference. The, the key is the big sources of energy. The man who told us it was premature to link climate change to extreme weather events says it's not premature for a government-led initiative. We need a commitment to energy innovation similar to what we have for the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Defense, and to sustain it for decades. Unless that's on the table, unless we're talking about that, we're going to nibble around the edges of this problem. To raise money for this, Pilkey suggests putting a small tax on fossil fuels, like gasoline, a tax that consumers would probably end up paying. It would raise tens of billions of dollars. But Pilkey says none of this will work if the U.S. acts in isolation. He says China and India, which pump huge amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere, need to be a part of the solution, too. And scientist Jason Box agrees that a Herculean effort is needed to protect future generations. It's kind of like, you know, putting a man on the moon, like, or, or going into World War II. These were things that Americans rallied around and felt good about, felt patriotic about. Are you equating what the world is facing with climate change to World War II, putting a man on the Absolutely. moon? Absolutely. That kind of... Drama. Yeah, it's kind of all hands on deck, really. We, we do need everyone. In the meantime, he has moved his young family from North America to Denmark. I thought for my daughter going forward that climate change would be less of a problem. The heat waves don't really affect Northwestern Europe so much. The other people we'd met on our journey are also adapting to the changes they've seen. Our house was over here in the grass. 
Pedro and Jen ultimately decided to take a government buyout and move away from their one-time dream home in Staten Island. Life is not going to stop for you. You stop and you mourn and, you, you know, you don't forget, but you have to keep going. Tara Shirk is rationing every drop of water and lives in dread of the coming wildfire season. She is wondering just how long she can hold out. It's sad. I mean, it's just, you know, I want to see my grandkids and everything grow up here. And, I, you know, we don't know if we have that future. Scientist Tom Wagner also thinks about his children and what climate change will mean for them. It's hard, you know, because I, and I worried a lot about, you know, the decision to have kids and the world and where it's going. At the end of the day, though, I am hopeful. You know, I think some of these things that we're talking about are things we can deal with. And one of the things that makes Wagner so hopeful is his faith in the next generation. You know, and I think if you're a young person today, one of the things to think about is, hey, what kind of career are you going to go into where you could potentially make a great contribution to this? Be it working on alternative forms of energy, you know, as an engineer or a physicist, be it being a climate scientist, you know, or even being kind of a policy person and trying to work out better ways society can use its resources and proactively deal with these changes. Up in the Arctic, there are ghost settlements now, relics from a fading way of life, as Inuit families abandon the ice that is melting all around them. It's a fate Inuit leader Akwalik Linge hopes we can avoid. Look out of the window and see how beautiful the nature is. Look at it and hear it. And protect it. Protect it. Take good care of it. It may seem like a distant concern when we're caught up in the business of our everyday lives, but many of the world's best scientific minds say climate change is real, it's here, and they put us on notice. They're asking, how will we respond?